Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the fifth session of uh, Caps Talk series. So as we are covering sequence theme, and last time we heard about uh, protein shears. So this time it is needle and haystack looking for nucleotide binders. Over to you, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Shailya. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm just trying to pick the slides up. And uh, can you all see the first slide? Yes. Okay. Uh, you know, when we think about DNA binding proteins, the first thing that comes to my mind is this really nice paper that had appeared in the first issue of genome biology back in 2000. And in fact, it's the first article. Uh, and this has been, um, uh, you know, this was reported by Professor Janet Thornton's group. It's a survey of the then available protein structures, uh, which have clear and they have talked about those proteins where there is clear evidence that uh, the protein would bind to DNA. So in fact, they had started looking for DNA bound forms uh, within the PDB. And uh, they had in fact uh, come across a handful of such uh, proteins and uh, they uh, were able to categorize into different groups. And uh, for instance, the group one, uh, is nothing but the helix turn helix motifs, which comprises a large number of the transcription factors. And in the group two were the zinc fingers, and then the group three would have been uh, some kind of repressors, which have coil coil structures. And then the group four has a mix of helix and so on. And uh, there are, you can see that there are uh, six groups shown in this slide as per their grouping. And then there were the the sixth and seventh category, which is non-enzymatic but other. And this is very interesting set uh, because uh, as we look along the timeline, and this is now a paper that I have just randomly picked up six, uh, six, 16 years later, 2016 paper. And it, this particular protein is interesting because it falls under the group seven. And that means it's not an enzyme, but it would in, interact with DNA. And you can see all the key terms that are very attractive for a biologist. Uh, for instance, it says uh, it's involved in uh, innate immune response. Uh, it, it is implicated in asthma and cancer. And uh, techniques such as uh, uh, structural X-ray scattering analysis, molecular dynamics, they have all been talked about. And also <coughs> mutation at the site of binding uh, to understand a bit more about the mechanism of, of action. Right? So this is kind of to tell uh, ourselves that it's a very uh, attractive area and a lot has been learned over time since 2000 when the Thornton's review had come and this sort of a paper 2016, 16 years later, and still it leaves behind a lot more to learn, right? And uh, the last group uh, that was proposed by Janet Thornton's uh, uh, you know, lab, uh, were on the enzymes. Enzymes such as these sort of endonucleases and uh, many others such as the topoisomerase. These are really fascinating structures. Uh, they come with a lot of embellishment. Some of them uh, have extra helices that we can see, the gyrases and so on. So this is uh, what we were learning, you know, to appreciate the structural categories or the groups uh, in which the DNA binding is a primary functional common property. But uh, how does our lab get affected? Uh, that's the story I'm going to tell. Uh, we had had, our lab had had our very first uh, grant, which I had explained a few uh, weeks ago, which was a Welcome Trust Senior Fellowship grant, which, using which we had purchased our first, very first computer cluster, uh, the Siberia, the cluster room, everything, right? And we had also dwelt on the structural motifs uh, this uh, second uh, grant, the very next grant uh, from our lab, uh, ha it has this uh, detail that um, is relevant to the story on DNA binding proteins, because uh, that was the time when my colleague uh, Matthew uh, had uh, spoken to me on the corridor and said, uh, Professor Uday Kumar, uh, unfortunately we have lost Professor Uday Kumar now, uh, and he said Professor Uday Kumar of the UAS GKVK, which is our neighboring campus, uh, on plant biology uh, uh, is interested uh, to look at uh, um, computational means of uh, understanding how uh, plant transcription factors would interact with 
uh, the upstream regions of genes that get uh, expressed, right? The transcription factor binding site. And in particular, they are interested in genes that are getting upregulated during stress response, such as desiccation and so on. And in my mind, and since this uh, review by uh, Professor Janet Thornton's group has had a strong influence, I immediately in my mind, I recall this, uh, uh, the huge groups of DNA binding proteins. And I had imagined that I would be modeling, or at least our group will be modeling some DNA binding proteins and how it binds to DNA and we might be doing some dynamics but actually it was none of these. Uh, actually, we turned out uh, that we started uh, writing some algorithms by which we would create hidden Marco models and then search for uh, such patterns, binding site patterns upstream of the genes of relevance. But that's the story that I will probably tell much later on, say end of uh, next month, end of April. Uh, but back to this uh, story on the DNA binding proteins, uh, it also uh, gave us a, a number of um, learning experience that that particular grant on the uh, desiccation response, uh, which we worked with Professor Uday Kumar. For instance, we got intrigued to know that certain transcription factors, which is the group one of DNA binding proteins, might actually be so close that they are physically interacting in uh, when it comes to the genome and so on. So that's where we got interested to ask a general question, leave alone only transcription factors. Can we go and implore into the entire genome of Arabidopsis thaliana and then ask how many DNA binding proteins may be there? And this was a time in uh, 2010, right? And just after the DBT grant. And this was also the time when we had, uh, had enough experience doing genome-wide surveys of other protein families, such as phosphatases and uh, so on, which I already described. Uh, so here we are, um, we knew that there were uh, 54 families and uh, eight groups uh, of DNA binding proteins as described by Janet Thornton's group. So we asked a simple question and that was the time Sony Malhotra had joined the group. Uh, and uh, we uh, asked the question, if we were now to go back and look into the protein structural data bank, how many families are we likely to realize? And how many groups are we likely to appreciate? And for this, uh, this is a schematic that uh, Sony had uh, ascribed to show that if we go and search in the structural data bank, uh, uh, you know, uh, starting off, let us say from those 54 families that Thornton's group had already ascribed, do some sequence search and recognize the pre-existing elements and then see what happens. Are we getting new families? Are we just getting more members into pre-existing families? Are there newer groups coming? And this is actually much more than searching for needle in a haystack because we are now looking for many needles, yeah. And the needles are of various sizes and the needle and the hay, you cannot easily distinguish. So it is much more challenging than that simple question of needle in a haste. However, uh, Sony had uh, shown this again, the results schematically to show that indeed, uh, not 54, but now, now meaning in 2010, there are 174 families and um, newer groups were not many. And this uh, kind of a picture shows us that. And for instance, you can see that the new group, there is one new group which she has shown in this uh, orange color. New families are shown in blue stars and the pre-existing families are shown in golden stars and so on. So this sort of an expansion kind of alerted us that with incoming uh, protein PDP entries, we have to be rather careful of uh, gathering our start point, which is our database. Uh, and then something more happened because you know none of these were really written on stone, right? And these sort of computational pipelines actually take an awful lot of time. And typically uh, our lab projects take anything, uh, a minimum of three years to uh, get ourselves convinced that yes, indeed our pipeline is robust because we do uh, start off with all sorts of questions uh, such as what he values to use. And by the way, this is actually uh, a capture of my own lab notebook. This is my handwriting. And uh, what I have tried to uh, do is to just write down as we were, as I was discussing with Sony, which uh, is the date of 2010, as you can see. And for instance, we ask questions like, what is the value? What is the query coverage filter that we should use? And then whether we should use alignments of uh, homologous 
protein sequences to kind of add in more evolutionary data to these sort of 154 families and um, various other things. Because as we were going by, we did a number of creative things, which is to uh, having obtained an alignment, we would do jumpstart type labs, which is just to give the alignment that's there. But we also ended up creating some dummy data sets and, uh, and so on. Um, so this is to just to show that none of these are uh, actually uh, written up. And this has uh, such pipelines, computational search pipelines often have to be created depending on the protein family we are looking at or the kind of uh, large set of families as it is in this case. Right. Uh, we also worried about whether we are um, dealing with multiple domain containing genes. And uh, sometimes you may have whole assemblies where only one or two of them may be involved in DNA binding. So all this had to be uh, dissected out. And um, Sony, <laughs> in my mind, I call it her, I was thinking of her today morning as a supersonic Sony. Why? Because she's always so fast. Not to say that these computing methods are so fast or our um, um, coming up with the pipeline is rapid, but her uh, work on the computer was quite fast. And you can see like four days later, she has come again for a discussion. And uh, there we are trying to figure out. And she did. And um, she will explain to you very soon how it is applies to the genome of interest, which is Arabidopsis thaliana. And as we were doing this, just imploring into the structural data plan, uh, we also uh, realized that we ought to consult the newer papers that have already been saying something very specific about uh, DNA binding proteins, such as transcription factors. So we gathered information from there, looked then into the sequence database. And sequence of uh, domain families are kind of curated very well in databases such as PFAM and Interpro. And when we included them, then uh, as expected, the numbers grow. And instead of handling um, 500 and on uh, families, we are now left with 1057 uh, DNA binding protein families. So um, this is to say that the creation of the start database is often the most time consuming to convince ourselves that our uh, start point is uh, robust. And uh, once we had the database ready uh, and uh, having already done genome-wide survey for other protein families, uh, Sony then looked into the Arabidopsis genome and then uh, identified 4,471 genes. And this, this is not a number that just comes straight away, because as you would have seen in our previous uh, talks, we do perform a large number of computational validation. And in this case, Sony also had done a number of, uh, consulted a huge amount of literature. So um, at this point, I think I really ought to um, um, let Sony explained what she uh, felt and found uh, when she was looking for the DNA binding protein families in the Arabidopsis genome. Uh, Sony is here with us, although uh, she had finished her PhD in 2014 uh, for these talks. Uh, we've been very fortunate to have uh, both uh, Sony and Preeta later on uh, who are going to tell their viewpoint. Sony, please. Great, thank you, ma'am. Wow, that, that was a beautiful, um, you know, memories and and all 13 years ago what we did together and yeah it was it was great thank you very much so yeah so i will um i'm well sorry for the croaky voice i have uh, woken up with a bad cold and um, and yeah so yeah but i think i um i will share the slides now yeah great so yeah so when ma'am said that we're celebrating 25 years of caps and i got that email and I was like of course very happy but then the first thing came to my mind was it's called lab 25 as well so 25 will be you know meaningless now and of course this journey is going to continue four years and years I'm very sure and a very successful one um so yeah I mean as mom said I was in the lab from 2009 to 14 and um uh it was a it was a very beautiful time I mean I owe my academic uh journey and even my personal journey to the lab because my husband is a gift from the lab as well. So, <clears throat> so this is um, this is my uh, first slide of my thesis actually. So, to basically summarizing what I've been doing in the lab. So, uh, the first bit was to looking at the structures of the DNA binding proteins and analyzing these um, DNA binding motifs in the protein partner of these complexes. 
we went ahead and looked at some of the complexes in detail where we modeled how the transcription factors are interacting and uh, these transcription factors are special transcription factors which are in a Arabidopsis genome in response to stress as, as was highlighted uh, in MAM slides as well. And the third picture you see here is a little um, approximately 100 amino acid domain which binds to RNA and we'll come to that a bit later. So basically, this interest in um, DNA binding proteins started from um, um, started in actually 2008, where I was um, 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 doing my undergraduate project. And what we were doing was were to analyze, uh, you know, again, the proteins which are upregulated during stress conditions. So when I joined the lab, uh, that was just the perfect timing. And um, uh, Shamir and Mam were looking at the, the stress responsive genes in Arabidopsis. And um, I continued working with them, and that was my rotation project. And then we managed to publish this work, and uh, we um, uh, hypothesized which interactions can take place between what genes, between what transcription factors, and how, and model those complexes as well. But then what I'm going to talk to you in detail today is about the protein DNA and a bit of RNA interactions. So in DNA, I'm I'm not going to repeat what uh, what Mam has just proposed. But then over the ten years, which was 2000, when the uh, Thornton uh, uh, Thornton's review came out, and then 2010, when we were looking at, there was a huge expansion. And then we looked at them, and we have already seen we realized a new group, which was an interesting beta propeller. I'm just highlighting this because we see this overrepresented in the plant genome, uh, which you will see a bit later. So this is a beta propeller, uh, which is a Salmon bladed beta propeller, which binds to the with, uh, to a protein partner. So, <clears throat> coming on to um, um, you know we we had one seventy four families, yes, but then as you know as highlighted, this was massively increased to thousand families if we had if we go into the sequence da databases, and there was a, a a nice strategy we had where we you know looked for these families in the protein family database, which is now taken over or integrated into Interpro. So. We had the our, our classification, which was structure based. We had another paper which came out in 2009, which was a human census on transcription factors. So, you know, just not to miss uh, transcription factors, we included everything from there. And then the PFAM description and Go annotation was a lot of, lot of manual work to go through the description and see if there were DNA binding uh, function ascribed to them. Where there was a Go annotation, it was straightforward, but then where there wasn't, then it was a bit of a work. So, um, and then um, we realized that there was these thousand families and, uh, you know, first thing which comes to your mind is to actually look at these families, how how different they are, what what sort of sequences are there in these families, how how much are they related, so this is the question we asked first, and as you can say, they, they, they vary in their population and, you know, some of the families were well studied, well described, they were very highly populated, others were very vastly populated. The length varied between the families as well, because as as it was highlighted in introduction, sometimes you just have a DNA binding domain, but then most of the times you have an adjacent or an adjoining domain, which is called co-occurring domain in, in the protein partner. So that, that describes to why the length is, is variant and is more. And then we looked at the percentage identity, I, percentage identity, identity between the members. And as you can see, this was also very, very um, uh, low. So that means these families are, are tricky because between members, there is very low sequence identity. The two families stand out with the, with the high sequence identity, 98 or 96% respectively. And that was because they were new families and they had only two members. And then we looked at their representation in a different uh, taxonomy, taxonomy, well, namely eukaryotes, bacteria, archaea, viruses. And these, what I've highlighted here, are some of the archaeal or the viral specific families. So having, you know, now having said that, we have got the eukaryote representation. And what we want to now highlight in this eukaryote is where are the plants standing there? Also, we, you know, we analyze these families for the number of domains and what sort of domains they have. And most of them, so more than close to 80% actually had an adjoining domain, uh, which carries out the functions. So yeah, so you still have 1000 families. But then at that time, when I was in the lab, there was a structure genomes initiative, which was, um, uh, you know, uh, going on in full swing. And there were a lot of structures coming out in the protein data bank from the structure initiative. So we thought of uh, using this um, uh, idea, which which I think you have heard in a previous talk of sequence searches, 
uh, where, you know, ma'am talked about these special mathematical profiles, which are built using different methods. And then you try and relate different families at a super family level. And this is exactly what we did. So you have like thousand families. And then what you try to do is if you haven't got any higher level organization in PFAM, you try and put them into a cluster. And you and you do that basically, you know, you take your sequence from one family, you go to the mathematical profile of the other family, and you see if they recognize each other using the sequence search methods. And like this, we were able to propose uh, certain clusters. This was the maximum populated uh, cluster with eight families in it. So, you know, why I said structure genomes initiative is because then you can propose that if you have to prioritize a structure for, uh, uh, prioritize a sequence for structure determination, it could be one from this family because then, you will have a structure known for all these uh, families. So this super family or the cluster will, will make more, uh, you know, make a nice target. <clears throat> so now we have these thousand families. We started, so basically you have these thousand families. You have the DBPOM, which we called at that time. And then uh, you have, and there was a fully sequenced Arabidopsis Theliana genome available at that time. So you have both the things, what you are looking for and where you are looking for. And then we started mining the genome for these DNA binding proteins. Um, with that, you know, this was a complicated um, um, pipeline we had, but then in, in a very simple way, it was just using, again, mathematical profiles. But then, you know, first question is like, because you don't know DNA mining proteins in Arabidopsis thaliana, first question you have is, okay, I have got this pipeline, which is fairly complicated, has got all the sequence search methods and everything, but will it work? And if it is working, is it true? So validation plays a very, very important role here. So what we did was, you know, as you have heard, lab has had quite a lot of experience in, in genome-wide service, and there were very well-characterized families like uh, serine carboxypeptidases, subtilisins. We used those, where in the plant genome, you already have very highly annotated members of that family. You adopt the protocol you have designed for DNA binding proteins, and you see if you are going to pick up those members or not, because those were highly annotated families, which have already come out of genome-wide service. So you know the, um, you know, the true positive, you know, the, the, the golden truth. So basically we did the same. We used this search strategy using different mathematical profiles and sequence search methods, and we were able to characterize those families. So that gave us a confidence that the pipeline is working, but that doesn't mean that you don't have to do validation on the hits you will obtain using this pipeline for a particular family of your interest, which is DNA binding proteins in this case. So we basically identified, that's why we call the putative DNA binding proteins in Arabidopsis thaliana. And then you have, then you do a proper validation of these hits where you can look, because you know the DNA binding domain, you can look for that DNA binding domain, whether it's present in that hit or not. And also you can, um, uh, you know, go for go and uh, you can look for go annotations, which are functional annotations. So where they actually uh, are ascribed with the DNA function or not. So uh, having said that, the DNA binding domain worked nicely, but the go annotations were missing for most of the plant genomes. And that was the main motivation of doing this work because there were a lot of hypothetical proteins in the plant genome. And when we were doing this, um, uh, you know, sequence searches and mining the, mining the plant genome, we actually annotated quite a lot of hypothetical proteins, which was a nice um, exercise um, in return. So this is what we essentially did. So this is these are the groups which Ma'am was talking earlier. So these are the eight groups. and. What you see here is the representation of these hits, which were like 4,000 odd hits in Arabidopsis thaliana. So, and we saw that, you know, there were um, a nice representation in different groups. Some of the groups highly populated, some of the groups um, very, very less populated. But to highlight here is beta propeller, which was the new group, which was formed from our uh, classification. And you have that um, very nicely represented in this genome. And that's because um, these beta propeller proteins are DNA repair proteins. And as you know, plants, by by the nature of you know them standing out in the sun and in, in outside all, all the time. They are prone to a lot of DNA repair. So they have all the DNA repair machinery in place. And that's why you see this particular group being overrepresented here. So just to highlight, just to summarize this work very quickly, um, or or just to highlight what we actually did was we carefully validated all the hits we obtained or all the putative proteins we obtained using the search strategy. Then we studied this family-wise distribution. And as I said, we um, uh, we annotated a lot of unknown and hypothetical proteins in in the Arabidopsis genome. And then our um, you know our interest was to look in the plant DNA repair, 
And that was, you know, that was the stress DB transcription, uh, stress DB database, which was being developed in the lab. And that was addressing DNA repair a lot because it was in response to stress. And uh, so this is the DNA repair. So these are different families which are involved in DNA repair function. And you see one family standing out here. And this family is the family which resolves holiday junctions during the DNA repair mechan uh, mechanism. And uh, there were 36 DNA repair families which were uh, represented in this plant genome. And 200 odd proteins from the 4,000 were, were actually ascribed as DNA repair. So that was a nice um, um, thing to do. And we were very excited. And honestly, I have to agree, Ma'am's notes were better than my notes, what I was writing in my notebook, but <laughs> they were much, they were very neat and very organized. <laughs> Mine was not like that. And um, uh, and then we have the, <clears throat> then what we did was, uh, so, so this is what you see, the first bit of Arabidopsis thaliana, the 4,000 proteins represented in 300 families. But then why bother about yeast, um, you know, the worm and the drosophila? And that was because what we wanted to do is we have got these 4,000 proteins in Arabidopsis. We wanted to see which functions are overrepresented. And now you can't say certain functions are overrepresented unless you compare it with other genomes. And that's why we had to repeat the whole pipeline with the three genomes, which was the yeast, the worm, and the drosophila, the fly. And <clears throat> once we had that, Basically, what you do is you have the same number of proteins, like, you know, 720. You have 720 because the genome is smaller. 720 and this, these many families and so on. And now what you do is you try and annotate the go functions, ascribe the functions, and the common functions in all the genomes are what of your interest. That, that is what you can compare because that has representation in all the four genomes. And when we did that, this was really, really nice thing to see. The functions which were standing out in Arabidopsis thaliana were, again, related to DNA repair. So that was, uh, you know, um, sort of expected. But then, when it when you see the proof of hypothesis, you know, you know, you are you are delighted that you know what what you did is 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 making sense. So basically, what we did uh, for the protein DNA interactions is like we revisited the classification and we proposed the, you know new new groups and and expanded the families, and then we used these families to go into the protein family database and um, make make a full dbpom. Uh, having all the DNA binding protein families from the uh, both the structure and the sequence database. So this can be, we used it for Arabidopsis thaliana, but then this repository is available in CAPS and can be used for, for mining any genome of interest. I'm sure this needs update now, yes. And this was identified, you know, we identified 4,000 proteins which were distributed across 300 families out of the 1,000 families, um, total DNA binding families. So yeah, so that 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 was the work on DNA binding proteins. Um, yeah, and of course, I I I I I'm very very thankful to my PhD supervisor, just Professor Sudamini, my TCM members who were uh, very 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 helpful, Professor Srinivasan from IAC and uh, Dr. Yamuna Krishnan from NCBS, who were um, very nice and uh, when required and very strict when required as well. <laughs> And Kanan and Newman, I worked with them on uh, protein-protein interactions, which I'm not talking today. And then the whole lab, it was, um, I mean, I had zero computational background when I joined the lab. So it was very, very helpful to have such a such a nice, friendly, um, you know, people in the lab who, who were always there. I mean, I remember, because Adwit is in this group, I will mention an, an incident with, with Adwit. I had my code written, well, well, not the code written, but what I want to write on a piece of paper. And we went to a cafeteria around like 10 in the, in the night, you know, and then we were discussing this. And then he was telling me, how can I code this in Perl at that time? So yeah, so, it, you know, it was, it was such a friendly atmosphere. And um, most of us were there in the lab in the night, and it, it was very nice, yeah, yeah. And then lab, the whole of the lab and help desk, which is the IT support. We had a fantastic IT support and uh, Department of Biotechnology for my funding and NCBS for all the infrastructure. Thank you, Sony. Uh, I, I'll just um, get back to what I wanted to say with respect to the evolving story, and uh, Sony will stay, but just to give you a uh, uh, feel for what this means. Uh, once we have uh, identified these uh, DNA binding proteins uh, in the Arabidopsis genome, and uh, the kind of uh, statistically significant inferences that Sony very nicely described, uh, what happens next? Uh, uh, so I hope you're able to see my screen. 
uh, but then this is not moving. So that means maybe I should go back and then share again. Yeah, I'll do that. And uh, so you're, I hope you're able to see, yeah, we have to see the slide on RRNs, yes. Okay, so as this uh, work was evolving somewhere, I think I must have chatted about uh, our uh, recent work on uh, looking for DNA binding proteins in Arabid Arabidopsis taliana and uh, to some visitor or the other, and uh, they might have told, uh, why don't you look for this kind of a protein family, which are also nucleotide binding proteins, but they are called uh, RRNs, uh, the RNA recognition modules. So uh, Sonia and I sat down and thought about it. And after all, this is going to be just one family. Uh, so shall we try? And we use more or less similar uh, computational principles and uh, look for RNA binding proteins now and digress therefore to looking for RNA binding proteins now in the human genome. So the question really was uh, how we can fine tune our uh, pipeline to look for this particular protein family in the human genome and the kind of analysis that uh, emerged, uh, which is shown in this uh, box here. Uh, so with this sort of an introduction, I would again uh, request uh, Sodi to tell her part of the story on RRM domains. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the, so that was the, um, um, you know, as after the NMI mining proteins, we started doing, working on this um, uh, RNA, I can't move the slides as well. Yeah, okay. So these proteins, um, you know, RNA binding proteins, um, I think to this audience, I need not explain why they're important and, and what they do. But then and there are multiple of them. And RRM, which is RNA recognition motif, is one of the highly um, uh, or the highly present or the most abundant RNA binding protein in the higher vertebrates or eukaryotes. And um, sequence-wise, it's a very small domain, um, less than 100 amino acids, and very highly rich in aromatic amino acids for two particular motifs, which were identified in this particular family. Structure-wise, again, it's a, a nice um, uh, four, um, four, four, four strand, uh, four beta strand, uh, a sheet made of four beta strands and against two helices. Oh, why can't I move the slides? Yeah. So, so these are the two, two motifs which I was talking about. These are very high, you know, rich in um, aromatic amino acids, and they are present in all the sequences which are uh, annotated, as, annotated as RNMs. And structure-wise, this is how they look. Um, very small, very, very small um, domain. And so what we tried to look for was look for these RNM uh, proteins in the PFAM database so that, again, we can have this inventory, which is like what we are looking for. And then you have the genome of interest. And then we looked in the PFAM, and then <laughs> there were seven of these families. Some of them are only specific to certain particular taxon taxonomic group. And again, at, the, at that time, this is just a seed sequence, not the whole PFAM uh, uh, family distribution. But then this is what we had at that time in 2013 or so when we were looking at it. And, and then the first thing we looked at was like how, how, dif how different they are. It, for for a one particular family, how different are the hits with the, how different are the proteins within a one within one particular family? And as you can see, some some families are very you know very wide, whereas some are very narrow in their percentage distribution. But what I would like you to look here is specifically at the RRM family one, three, five, and six. So as you can see, that the percentage the average uh, sequence identity is less you know it's very close to twenty percent. So what you expect is that when we were trying to look for them using this particular sequence search methods, if you build their mathematical profiles, which are these family specifics, there is lot, there's going to be a lot of crosstalk because these families themselves are very, very diverse in terms of sequence identity. And this is exactly what happened. What you can see here is that, you know, we have the four clusters, uh, the dark the brown or dark red, and then magenta, red, and cyan. Whereas the other three families, which I just highlighted, one, five, and six in that plot, they are co-clustering. So this is, so basically when you use your sequence search method to look in the genome of interest, you don't know how to ascribe a particular hit which you will obtain after, if you use this sort of classification, because there is a lot of crosstalk going on. So then we did the phylogeny and we basically reclassified these proteins. And we had like, you know, <coughs> families merging for our uh, sequences merging for RNM 1, 5, and 6, respectively. So what do you 
this inner circle, these are these were our new clusters, and we use this thing to we use this new clustering to look into the uh, human genome this time. And we identified uh, close to 900 RNM containing gene products, which were again subjected to a lot of validation, again using Go, Go functions and the domain, domain architectures. And then we did sort of Go enrichment analysis, again, that sort of uh, thing looking at which function is overrepresented in these sort of proteins. And disorder content because RNA binding proteins and specifically RNMs are known to be involved in neurodegenerative diseases. So, and these sort of proteins which play a role in neurodegenerative diseases are having, uh, you know, they, they have a high uh, disorder content. So this is how the, the, the putative uh, RRM containing hits in the, in the human genome look like. So RRM, RRM, RRM1 was the highly represented um, uh, domain and it never occurred in, you know, alone. So it was always accompanied by the, uh, the, the coexisting domains, and sometimes a coexisting domain, which is not an RNM binding protein, which is here, which is called the FOX1C uh, domain. And um, so, so that's, that's again, you know, the bottom plot is just showing you which domain, which is non-RNA binding, is, is um, highly represented in this genome. So as I said, most of these gene, uh, genome, gene products had a, other than RNM domain, and some of them were non-RNA non binding as well. And then we looked at what sort of biological process do they um, play a role in? And then as we can imagine, it was mRNA processing and RNA splicing, which was highly uh, represented in, the, in these sort of gene products. And uh, yeah, so basically we studied the RNA, which most of them are in RNA binding motif in eukaryotes and specifically in human genome. Uh, we looked for these genome gene products. We adopted, we made a nice pipeline, which was, uh, uh, using very various se sensitive sequence search methods to identify these proteins in the human genome. And uh, yeah, I think that was the time I was uh, running out of time and out of funding. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so this is the same slide. I, I would just like to thank, thank the lab uh, again. Yeah, thank you, Sonny. The, that was a very beautiful uh, way of describing uh, specifically on RRM proteins what we were learning and uh, my God, there's so much to learn. Uh, but then, uh, let me then uh, take you to please stay online, um, Sony, because uh, then yes, you take some I will be there. Uh, however, uh, what I will now try to do is to uh, take you to the second part of the story, uh, which is completely on RNA binding proteins. And the cure, I have a problem with you. Huh. Okay, so we heard about RRMs and then um, we wanted to uh, venture uh, rather in a more committed manner, looking for all possible RNA binding proteins uh, in the human genome. And uh, as luck would have had it, but I had not one uh, super student, but uh, following that also I had this really efficient other student, Preeta Ghosh, uh, who joined, who had joined um, 2012. So that means both of them had some common time. Uh, but since this uh, analysis uh, of RRM binding proteins turned out to be so fruitful, we learned a number of things. Uh, we uh, asked ourselves whether uh, Preeta can now look for uh, all possible RNA binding proteins. And uh, again, we referred to this uh, genome biology paper of, uh, from Janet Thornton's group back in 2001. And as opposed to the DNA binding proteins, there were 14 families and only 32 PDB entries. Not to say that it will remain the same way, but over time things have changed, of course. Uh, however, uh, what we realized and we were prepared was the fact that when we are searching for these RNA binding proteins, however fine-tuned our uh, search schema and pipeline might be, uh, there is a very good chance that we are likely to encounter uh, some of the DNA binding proteins. Because after all, both of them recognize uh, um, um, anion binding small molecules, uh, right? So whether it is DNA or RNA, uh, the overall surface might be similar. So we had a concern, anticipated concern that how on earth are we going to distinguish them? But uh, really speaking, the kind of uh, issues that came up were not uh, the fact that we could enter into false positives, but the fact it's because that we entered into the human gene. <laughs> because there's a lot of data available by then uh, however, uh, we were also faced with uh, a number of uh, allied issues because other groups 
uh, from other laboratories had also been documenting uh, their observation of uh, RNA binding proteins. And uh, we restricted to comparing uh, those repositories which had primarily used computational tools. Some of them, for instance, the Gersbergers group in, uh, had uh, looked for the direct binders and they had not included those which are in assemblies. And they would also um, look for only those which are annotated. And uh, another group which, uh, of which the database is called as SpotSeq, uh, they had primarily used function prediction techniques, namely the RNA binding chemical groups uh, to infer uh, which are amongst a whole genome, in the human, same human genome, uh, how many of them are likely to be uh, binders, RNA binders. And in terms of the numbers, we had similar values uh, because uh, Preeta had found from her very uh, sophisticated sort of a pipeline. Uh, uh, and at this point of time, we already decided we will refer these uh, approaches as structure-centric approach and the sequence-centric approach because that's what we learned from our previous work on the DNA binding proteins. But then uh, she had found about 2,600 such uh, putative members in the human genome the numbers were rather comparable between these other groups, but what was most stunning is that uh, the kind of uh, agreement with these two repositories with our own finding is not very high. However, the comparison if we do between the two other databases themselves is also not high, suggesting that it depends on how uh, we are looking for the RNA binding proteins in any genome. And more importantly, we uh, came to the humble realization that there is no proper global standard uh, for uh, RNA binding proteins. Because if we were to use high throughput wet lab techniques, depending on the type of technique, you can have uh, a variety uh, of um, uh, them. And uh, some, it depends on the type, like whether you're looking at it for cool down experiments or whether you're doing an clip experiments and your results can be quite different. However, uh, let's hear from Preeta uh, uh, from her own words about uh, her experience uh, looking for uh, the RNA binding proteins in the human gene. Preeta, please. Oh, and also following this, she will uh, describe uh, her own experience picking up one of the members which we call as a TRA2, uh, because between uh, TRA2 paralogs, we had realized due to our collaboration with Sushma uh, that uh, it, uh, two paralogs could have different RNA binding affinities. So she's going to tell them one after another three times. Yeah, I mean, even after all these years, uh, whenever I come to speak in this lab, there are butterflies in my stomach. And uh, like Sony mentioned, uh, when ma'am decided to absorb me as a PhD student in the lab, I came with complete experimental background and a person who has never seen Linux before. And I don't know what she thought that day when she decided me to accept me for a rotation project in the lab, but I think it, it changed my life. Um, my professional life changed from that day. I mean, till then I was having quite a rough patch. It was not working out, but the the faith she showed in me that day, I think that changed my uh, professional care career forever. Yeah, so I, so I would I would definitely start by first acknowledging her. Uh, I mean, this would not have been possible had she not stood by me and showed me the confidence. And I'll tell you the reason why uh, slightly later. Um, why that was very important for me. Uh, so, and this is the TRA2 protein, which she was referring to. We found this animation uh, very interesting, and that's why I had stuck to this for uh, my uh, introductory slide in the thesis seminar, uh, which was exactly six years ago, uh, six years, two months ago from now. Um, yeah. Okay, now my slides are not changing yet. Okay. So this is uh, an impression of a cell and the different types of RNA binding proteins that can be there in the cell. And this is a um, uh, animation and this is schematic representation. So you will see the variety 
uh, all the different processes that it's involved in, the structural variety, the functional variety. So it's absolutely essential uh, for any functioning of the cell from the ribosome to the spliceosome, everything is composed of RNA binding proteins. And um, they meet the diverse functional requirements of the cell and um, they regulate uh, co-transcriptional and post-transcriptional gene expression. Uh, and their structural components of the ribosome and the spliceosome, which are the main molecular machineries of the cell and are responsible for uh, the huge repertoire of RNA and transcripts and proteins. And RNA, uh, the complication comes from the fact that uh, it does not recognize protein in just a sequence-oriented manner, but it does so as a combination of sequence and or structure. So you can never predict whether the same RNA, the same protein will recognize different RNAs uh, based on the condition, based on their environment, and that can be guided both by sequence and structure. So we had to take both into account. And like ma'am mentioned, they were uh, much less studied in 2012, at least after that, there was a boom in the study of RNA binding proteins. But when we started, it was a less crowded space. It was much less studied as compared to DNA binding proteins. Um, uh, so RBPs or RNA binding proteins, I'm going to uh, abbreviate them as RBPs. They have a modular organization. So uh, each of these uh, boxes that you see in different colors, they are different um, schematic representations of RNA binding domains. And as you can see, um, the domains can be organized in any combination, uh, separated by any linker size, and that will define uh, what all different functions a protein can perform. And each of them are independent domains, so they have their individual functions, some of which we know, some of which we don't know. And that was the uh, mystery space that we were diving into. So, for example, if you have two different domains, the red and the yellow, and two different RNA binding motifs based on the size of the linker, they can bind two RNA motifs either uh, very closely spaced in the RNA or uh, slightly far away from each other on the same RNA or even on different RNA fragments. So that's how they uh, increase their repertoire of binding RNA because there are much less number of RNA binding proteins than there are RNAs in the cell. And there are extreme examples like this where multiple combinations, eight, uh, seven different repeats are binding to seven um, uh, RNA motifs on the same protein. It's called the Pumilio homologue, where you see each nucleotide is binding to a, a, a combination of uh, a domain which has three alpha helices. So this is to increase the affinity towards the RNA. So such examples have also been shown in nature. And uh, surprisingly, these were the first set of RNA binding proteins that were described and structures were solved. So the question uh, which we were trying to address is that whether we can uh, identify the human RBPOM, the repertoire of all RNA binding proteins on the basis of these known um, se uh, sequence signatures. So today I'll talk only about the sequence signatures and um, because the structure is uh, beyond the scope of today's discussion, but we will be discussing that in uh, a later um, uh, to a series of talks. So uh, apart from the 437 structure-centric RNA binding protein families, uh, we identified around 750 sequence-centric RNA binding protein families. So these were families present in PFAM, which had an RNA binding protein uh, annotation. And uh, they were either they were all um, families which are known to interact with RNA directly because there are a lot of indirect RNA interactors where the RNA interacts with the protein and the protein interacts with another protein. So that's not what we call. I'm sorry. So that's not what we call RNA binding proteins here. So we are only looking at direct interactions. So we look, um, we took these structure-centric families, sequence-centric families, and of these around 1,200 families, we used, uh, we used uh, HMM search uh, to uh, search the human proteome for sequence signatures of RNA binding proteins. So this was search was carried out in May 2015. And then we found around 2,600 putative RNA binding proteins, still putative because we were yet to validate it. And all of these proteins have sequence or structure signatures for RNA binding. 
So like Sony uh, showed in the previous RRM um, uh, talk that um, the, the most abundant of RNA binding proteins is the uh, RNA recognition motif. And they have uh, two different uh, motifs which are known to bind to RNA, RNP1 and RNP2, which are highlighted in different colors. And they are part of the beta strands of the RRM motif. And here is an example. This is a double-stranded RNA, which is unusual, quite rare. This is a uh, um, this is one of the RNA binding proteins in complex with a double-stranded RNA, and showed in gray. Uh, gray are the residues which are within five angstrom. That's known for nucleic acids that if they are within five angstrom of amino acid residue, they can form hydrogen bonds, uh, non-covalent interactions, and with these proteins. So um, if we look at the RNA uh, binding residues, which are highlighted in gray on this protein, we will see that uh, comparing with literature, what is known for this protein, uh, they are, so we were able to predict the correct set of residues. So that way we knew that we are on track, we are identifying the correct set of proteins. This was one set of validations. And like we saw for DNA binding proteins, um, we were looking at, um, how the distribution of uh, RNA uh, binding protein domains were. The most uh, abundant are the RRMs, followed by the P-loop NTPases and the KH domains. But what was intriguing that almost 50% consist of are like other domains. So there are so many domains that we didn't know of or which are not a significant number. So this was the unexplored space which we were looking into. And uh, when we look at their functional annotations, we saw um, uh, cellular, sorry, cellular localizations. We saw that um, uh, they were mostly uh, nuclear, uh, like for transcription factors, they are also nuclear. So spliceosomes, they are also nuclear. And uh, what was interesting is there were RBPs, RNA binding proteins, which are present in both nucleus and cytoplasm, means these can shuttle in between the nucleus and the cytoplasm. And this is one of the main roles RNA binding proteins play. They get hold of RNAs inside the nucleus and get them outside and deliver them to the ribosomes. So this is one of, a, um, so these are also targeted by cancer drugs. So these are the proteins which are mostly targeted by cancer drugs, but majority are uh, nuclear. So coming back to the slide, which ma'am was showing. So this is where, um, um, I guess ma'am and I had sleepless nights and, um, we had real difficulty convincing the reviewers that uh, uh, why from the existing studies, um, we were not, so even though the numbers were comparable, like ma'am said, there were um, proteins which, um, you know, I mean, there were the numbers which did not overlap across the studies were quite big. And unfortunately, I guess one of the first time when we sent out this paper, uh, it went to the group who had authored, authored this paper and we were literally, uh, I think it was sent back without much ado. The next time we sent it out, uh, it went to my future postdoc advisor. Again, very strong comments, but that's when we thought, okay, now we are not going to be anybody's liability. We are going to uh, take strong steps and explain. So their concern was the following. So. Uh, so if you look at our study, uh, there were 1,000 proteins which were not identified in the existing studies. And we failed to identify quite a portion of the proteins which were there in the other studies. So what we did is we went by protein by protein in the ones which we had not identified and classified them into clusters and identified what is the common theme in these proteins and why are we missing it and how can we justify that. So I think that significantly strengthened our studies and ma'am and I sat through it rigorously uh, to ensure that we are not missing any common theme. So one of our biggest advantages was we were, because we were looking at structure and sequence centric families, which were directly binding to RNA, all the proteins that we identified and the other people missed were direct RNA binders. What we identified, which other people again missed, was dual DNA RNA binding proteins. So both of these studies were eliminating zinc finger domains, which are known to bind DNA, 
But what they had ignored is that these DNA binding proteins can also bind to double-stranded RNA at times and to other uh, RNAs, which are stem loop structures. Um, what uh, so so that was the second thing. What we also captured was um, these RNAs were moonlighting um, uh, proteins. So moonlighting was a very new concept then. So these RNA binding proteins were known as proteins, but not for binding RNA. So um, they were known to do other functions, but nobody knew that they can also bind to RNA, which was important to transcend that function below. So, and the most important thing which our um, study captured was that RNA binding proteins can open up or fold or change their structure based on the environment in which it is in. So most of these studies which deal with the uh, clip or chip, which needs to pull down based on an antibody will be only uh, identifying proteins whose RNA binding motifs are exposed on the solvent accessible surface. Uh, in contrast, what we were we were able to identify based on our sequence searches was also motifs which were buried in the solvent and accessible core, but given an environment can be exposed and can identify and bind RNAs, which were missed by the other studies. So these were strong enough uh, basis, and we showed examples as to uh, why and uh, this was accepted in molecular biosystems in 2016. And uh, this was a big win for us, for sure. So one example uh, of such proteins, which we newly discovered to have RNA binding properties. And this, um, it was, why I say it was a big win, because these this paper has been cited multiple times later um, as um, a sort of verification for other people who have later showed moonlighting properties for RNA binding proteins. So the first one is the cyclin-dependent kinase. It's a very well-known kinase, and we had ascribed RNA binding properties to it. And if you see from the positive patches, the one in blue on the surface of the protein, it's known that RNA binding proteins have discontinuous uh, positive patches on their surface so that they can bind to floppy RNA as opposed to DNA. So DNA binding proteins have a continuous stretch of um, positively charged residues because they are more cylindrical molecules. RNA binding proteins have patchy uh, surfaces because the RNA is floppy and they can bind anywhere. So this is the signature which we also see here. Same in coagulation factor X. So all these proteins uh, have later been shown to have um, known RNA binding properties because of which their functions are um, carried out in the cell. Uh, another example is the putative serine protease. There was no structure for this protein. So we modeled this and we docked an RNA um, from a similar structure uh, onto this. And we show that the RNA can bind to the uh, positively um, charged surface on the surface of the protein. So yes, so this is how we ascribed um, around 2,600 RNA binding proteins in the human genome, of which 1,100 were novel. And yeah, 40% of our study was novel. And 11% uh, did not have an explicit functional annotation till date. Um, so it was a high risk, high gain, like I said. And 30% uh, of the proteins were exclusively nuclear. And 15% have known disease associations, which is expected for RNA binding proteins. Few years later, when I was following up on this study, I saw that this had increased to 45% almost, So, which is also a good long-term validation for our study. And 30% of these are enzymes. So these are enzymes, um, I mean, proteins which bind to RNA and carry out enzymatic functions using their other domains. Uh, yeah, so this was... Um, so this is something which uh, we have done in a lot of projects and I will uh, just show you here quickly. So when you have to do this comparison across genomes uh, and you have multiple proteins, you cluster them and then you find out whether these are similar proteins or identical proteins. So this is a single link clustering method uh, which ma'am had, um, uh, I mean, identified and which we successfully carried out for all projects. What I'll quickly go through um, is whether uh, curtsy being in the same genome, the RNA binds to this, um, I mean, RNA binding proteins bind to RNA with comparable specificities. 
So TRA2 proteins are a part of this lysosome. They are RRM-containing proteins with a serine arginine-like protein family. They directly bind to target exons and activating splicing. And uh, Drosophila has a single protein, and it has diverged by uh, gene duplication into two proteins, TRA2-alpha and TRA2-beta in the human genome. And um, so uh, this is the central RRM domain flanked by two arginine serine-rich domains on either side. So the uh, so what we found is the chart two alpha. This was in collaboration with Dr. Shushma Grelshed's lab it, uh, in Nottingham at that point. So chart two alpha um, is present in much lower levels in all uh, tissues of the body than chart two beta, and they have indistinguishable RNA binding specificities. So the question was why do we need two proteins which have uh, very similar RNA bindings? I mean why would the cell um, spend energy to maintain harbor both of them? So this was a phenomenon called paralog compensation, where one of the two paralogs, these are products of gene duplication, so paralogs have um, uh, a weaker and the other is a stronger paralog. And um, they partially substitute for each other. So in case one of them is dysfunctional, the, because these are very important functions, the cell cannot afford to live without it. So they have a sort of backup copy. So it's called genetic backup. And uh, yeah, so to prove this, um, so what we saw when we look compared these proteins, I'm going through these quickly because we are running out of time. Sorry, I have short over time. Um, so when we align these proteins, we see the RNA binding um, residues, which are highlighted in gray, are exactly identical between the two proteins. So what distinguishes them? Uh, they are 81% identical in their RRM domain. So why do we need, um, I mean, how do we prove that they are uh, participating in uh, parallel compensation? So uh, these are a few functions of the TATU um, domain and uh, TATU protein. And if you look at the phylogeny, you will see in green is the Drosophila TATU. And in red is the chart 2 alpha and blue is the chart 2 beta. And you will see the chart 2 alpha is much more similar to the uh, chart 2 in uh, Drosophila. The, this means that, and it has been shown that chart 2 alpha can compensate for sex determination in uh, Drosophila. So it is slightly different functionally, but structurally in terms of RNA binding, there's not much difference. So then we model the structure of TRA2 alpha in comparison with TRA2 beta. And red is the alpha, blue is beta. And you will see they are indistinguishable uh, with the bound RNA. And we also looked at individual residue level comparisons where also they showed that it was shown that they are identical. So where was the difference? So if you, even if you look at 100 nanosecond molecular dynamic simulations, you will see the RNAs in green moving around similarly. Um, in the two proteins, alpha and beta. And uh, it was also known that um, uh, alpha, mm, I mean, the beta binds to another CA-rich uh, element, which is a 13 more and a stem loop structure. When we dock this to alpha, that's where we found the difference. We, you'll see the different orientations of binding of this RNA to the two proteins. And that's where their functional divergence comes from. So uh, quickly show the molecular dynamic simulations. You'll see the, the proteins um, uh, moving subtly, and, but the RNAs are flopping around, uh, in, especially in uh, beta. And this base in alpha is moving differently. So we looked at their binding partners uh, using the string database, and we saw they have different binding partners, means indeed they had functional divergence. And then the uh, main study was mutated this RNA to all possible combinations. And then we found that uh, indeed the RNAs bind always more tight to beta. So I mean beta is the more stronger paralog and alpha comes in uh, in between to compensate for uh, any uh, the absence of beta um, when it's not there or it's knocked down. Uh, so yeah, to conclude, this is a, a we showed the structural basis for the phenomenon of parallel compensation, and we have also uh, demonstrated, which I have not shown here, a similar compensation which is happening at the domain level. Uh, we had shown this using a protein called PTP uh, PTB1, uh, which had multiple RRMs, and we saw that the different RRMs have different binding affinities for the same protein. 
for, for the same RNA, not just two different proteins, but even within the same protein and different domains, that phenomenon can exist. And this has been shown to be a common theme in the field of RNA binding proteins in the later years. And these are the publications associated with what I talked about. Um, so this is a work which I had started during my rotation. Uh, uh, so Sony was initially guiding me with this. And then, um, so then was the battle with the uh, RNA binding protein genome wide survey. And um, later we extended this to E. coli genomes, which I didn't talk about now, but um, we used similar uh, approaches later. Uh, and showed it. Uh, yeah, thank you. And uh, I think, like I said, I cannot thank ma'am enough. Um, I think I would have been out of NCBS if she would not have trusted me that day. Not only did she trust me then, even when the paper, we were literally fighting a battle with the reviewer, she trusted me that uh, we were on the right track. And that means a lot to a young PhD student that your supervisor shows trust. Of course, I cannot thank the lab enough. They were and they still are um, my family. Uh, sorry that I couldn't come in person. I'm sitting on the other end of this city, uh, but it is a two hour almost to come, but uh, I will meet you in person soon, I promise. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Rita, for a very, very uh, lucid uh, story and uh, how you have shown that uh, such surveys are helpful. And uh, also the TRA2 story, because by the time, uh, we had looked uh, in the entire uh, approach of looking for uh, the 13 mer was entirely her uh, uh, idea and she had become so independent and so happy about it and of course uh, she talked to me this uh, very next day and the 13 mer was a break through uh, in understanding that parallel compensation by tra2 uh, uh, yeah, like Prita mentioned, uh, we didn't have, we don't have the time to talk about our searches in the E. coli genome. In fact, it was also supported towards the end uh, by uh, Dr. Bhai Joshi. Uh, but here, I would like to uh, mention that uh, Sony Manhotra, who had talked about the DNA binding proteins, uh, is currently in the UK in the uh, STFC, as it is called. Uh, and um, Prita, uh, on the other hand, she is uh, you know, a research scientist uh, in a company called Inference. Inference? Yeah, Inference. Uh, so that's about uh, the speakers for today. And uh, just a bit of uh, this and that. Uh, I think in the olfaction talk, we had uh, brought up some of the old photographs. But instead, what I'm going to just uh, pick up and uh, present uh, some random uh, lab notebooks uh, pictures. So this is one lab notebook of uh, mine in 2006. And you, as you can see on the right hand side, it is a little capture of our discussion on the locations project, which we presented last time, uh, which he worked, which we worked along with Parantu and our searches for the functional uh, residues and subfamily classification and so on. And um, yeah, this is uh, now. Uh, two um, papers that I found. Uh, in 2011, what is shown on the left-hand side are the list of computers. These are all like simple desktop machines, nothing very fancy, uh, but uh, it kind of shows you uh, how we were thinking, <laughs> the kind of names we were given for computers, and the people who were using them are also marked. Domains for Prashant Shingate, of course, uh, things like that. And then what I have on the right-hand side in the same year, 2011, uh, the different projects that we were uh, looking at then. So I had, uh, it gives me a great deal of, um, uh, um, you know, uh, offer, uh, it offers me a lot of comfort when I write down things. And I do this often, even when I'm traveling and whether it is a cover or something. So this is now an attempt to put down the number of projects and the people behind. And I have kind of scribbled some time frame underneath. So this is to kind of give you a glimpse of how we were thinking. And this is a, a map of our extension. You know, because initially our lab was, uh, um, the lab 25 was occupying this much space, but then as the number of people grew more and uh, we, uh, our lab had asked for an extra space, which uh, turned out uh, that it was an equipment room before. And you can see our uh, uh, work with the architects uh, and they have provided the flow map on the left-hand side. And this is uh, me 
uh, writing to the lab members, asking for volunteers as to who should do what and at what time and so on. So this all had to be done uh, within some uh, fixed time, right? Uh, so this is all part of the learning and uh, the journey. Uh, and um, I would uh, like to uh, request uh, Shafi uh, to, pre uh, to present the list of publications that had been, um, that are relevant to today's uh, stories. But afterwards, he will uh, uh, kind of mention the top title for the next week. But do please stay on uh, even after Shafi, Shafi mentions the two, uh, because I want, we want to consolidate our uh, sequence scheme as well. Shafi, please. Yeah, so uh, these are few of the most cited research from the talks today. Uh, so for DNA binding proteins, uh, these three are from Sony Malhotra's paper. Uh, first one is genome-wide survey in DNA binding proteins in Arabidopsis thaliana. And second one, uh, protein-centric two-tier classification, what she talked about. And the third one is the RNA recognition motifs. Uh, so the second set of stories, RNA binding proteins, uh, we have two Preeta Ghosh paper. Uh, first one is RNA binding proteins in uh, E. coli, and the second one is the database ECR BPO. Yeah. So uh, for next week, uh, we are shifting our gears from uh, sequence theme to structure theme. Uh, so for uh, first set of talk, we have uh, protein protein interaction. We have titled it Full Path Towards Protein Protein uh, Commitments. Yeah. So uh, stay tuned uh, next week we all thank you shafi uh, so as i promised uh, i will like to consolidate our attempts to present uh, some of our uh, research uh, in the theme of sequences this is what we had been doing uh, for the past uh, 5 weeks and uh, i would like to quickly consolidate uh, the talks and the, the timelines the people involved, your time frames in PhD or MSc, as the case may be, and how it mattered in terms of the appearance of the few publications, key publications that we had presented. Uh, the first talk was on sequence searches on the 2nd of February. Uh, so what I have tried to show as a schematic is our lab, started, which started in 98, and that's um, what we have shown in the purple color is the project time frame. And for the sequence searches, especially the ones that we had presented on the 2nd February, there were two PhD students uh, who were vitally involved, and first of them is actually Saikar, uh, and uh, then the next is actually Anirvan. And uh, your uh, PhD time frame as shown as bars. You can see that it overlaps very well with this project time frame itself. And in terms of the publications, the two papers uh, that we had presented fall uh, within uh, the time frame. That is just to give you an idea about how people played an important role in making these things happen. And also, there is some myth that uh, bioinformatics is easy. It may be very easy for publications. No, Preeta's story has clearly told that every one of these papers, uh, we go through similar struggles, we learn a lot, uh, some we get good review comments as well. So it always helps us to improve. Uh, the projects are not uh, fast either, because typically we take three years and maybe at least one more year to finish it towards the publication stage. And uh, the PhD students, it is none of them really finish very fast. They stay on with us at least for five years, as you can see, as you will see, because the second part of the story was on cascaded sequence searches. So here we had had Sandhya uh, Shankaran, uh, who had uh, been working on different aspects of the cascade sequence project that we described, but it was in collaboration with the late Professor Srinivasan's group. And we did have at least two students from his group participate and the number of uh, papers also we could produce a little more. But then the third story, which was on the genders, uh, it started off with a few people like uh, Anirban again, uh, but then the journey went on because later on Advait Joshi uh, carried it uh, on uh, by applying it on larger number of super families and more algorithms. And then finally, uh, Minakshi kind of lifted it uh, to look at many super families then. And uh, you can see that uh, we had been able to present only two key publications. And that, that's for the second, uh, sorry, the third story. Uh, all, all these were mentioned, uh, presented in the first talk, which was held on the 2nd of February. And the talk two was on protein domains, isn't it? So there, uh, we had actually presented four stories, 
One was on the pure, which is uh, uh, being able to predict uh, function to unassigned regions. The second story was an um, alignment-free domain architectures, where we think of proteins as a string of domains. And the third and the fourth stories were on phosphatase domains and the TIR domains. So as you can see from this, um, you, it is uh, pretty uh, obvious that the people involved had made a, played a key role and their time frame, how it matches with the progress of the projects. And uh, these are the papers. So I'm going to just uh, now present rather rapidly on the second, third, fourth, and the fifth talks, not going to so much detail, but uh, this schematic kind of tells you how the individual stories and the people and the publications. The publications are shown as little uh, rectangles here, and the person's uh, PhD time frame is shown as a block, and uh, the project block is also shown for uh, reference. The phosphatase is Anirbanantina, uh, and then the TIR, actually, we have not talked much about Mahita's contribution because of more on the structure theme. So we will talk about it later. We will present it. And uh, we had heard through uh, Shailia about their, um, our experience looking for TIR domains in many mammalian genomes. The top three was on olfaction, right? Or it was on the 16th February. Uh, here again, um, I presented initially uh, a story on looking for chemosensors in bacteria. And this was presented by Rajas, but actually it was co work with uh, one of my PhD students, uh, Nasir Pasha. And on the GPCRs, it was primarily done by Raghu Prasad Rao, at least the sequence analysis part. And I had presented it on his behalf. And uh, then on the ORs, we had multiple people. Uh, key players are uh, Naga, Snehal, because all three of them had uh, presented their part of the story. And on the OBPs, we had, uh, it's a very long journey, starting from Pugalendi, Malini, Bhavika, and so on. And on the fourth talk, which we uh, concentrated and uh, try to present stories on sequence searches of serine proteases and uh, particularly prolyl oligopeptidases. These were presented by Parantu and Lokesh to, um, to us. And Paran, uh, Parantu actually was a MSc student. Uh, and in fact, my very first student, so he's 98 to 2000, he presented this work. And then uh, we have uh, on the prolyl oligopeptidases, Swati and uh, Soumya. Uh, who is currently with us, who had presented uh, this uh, part. And on today's talk, uh, as you will very well remember, it was on the nucleotide binding proteins, namely the DNA binding proteins as presented by Sony Malhotra and uh, with a bit of introduction from my part, and then the RNA binding proteins, which were uh, which was presented by Krita Ghosh. And um, 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 again, once again, I would like to thank uh, both of them for very beautifully uh, narrating uh, this, these two stories. And uh, I just also would like to say that all this um, on the five uh, talks on the sequence team were made possible because of these people, uh, what I would call as the CAPS talks core members. Uh, that includes Advai, Dr. Advai Joshi, Dr. Meenakshi Ayer, Shaila Varma, uh, Mohammad Shafi, and Vikas Tiwari. These are the people behind the scenes who have been helping uh, generating a lot of these uh, schematics that uh, you would have seen, the protein videos that you might have seen. And we were uh, very uh, ably uh, guided by Sonal of the communications office. So we would like to thank, uh, I would like to thank all of them. And uh, the core team particularly would like to thank uh, the communications office as well as the instrumentation team of uh, NCPS TFR. And last but not the least, the audience for your patient uh, listening and all for the lovely uh, comments and questions that we have been getting. And most of the co uh, questions for today, we try to address then and there, and they have been answered live. But still, I find there is one question that perhaps uh, Rita would like to take. It says, uh, any sequence specificity for different family of also? It is for, uh, maybe Sony can also take it, which is, uh, uh, is there any sequence specificity for different family of RRM proteins? Or, or are, are all RRM proteins bind to RNA in a sequence independent manner? Uh, so perhaps Sony would like to take this question. Um, yeah, so I mean, uh, from my understanding, I think RNA, uh, RNM containing proteins can need not bind to the linear motifs, they can bind to all the floppy, um, unstructured RNA bit as well. 
So um, yeah, I think I, I don't think there is a lot of sequence um, uh, guiding that, that is happening there, but there might be some specific uh, motives in terms of the overall structure of the RNA, which it is binding, which is which can be structured or unstructured. But I don't I don't think I have seen any particular RNA motive uh, which it recognizes. Thank you. I, I don't know. Preeta might Preeta might want to say something. Yeah, so um, so later, I mean, uh, there wasn't anything till uh, like I was finishing my PhD. Uh, it was still like what Sony said. It was floppy motives and. But later during my postdoc, when I was doing this, gradually this theme was coming that it can there can be a sequence dependence, but it's still a, a, a hazy area. But RNA RRMs, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but then RRMs have, are more sequence dependent than our other RNA binding proteins. Yeah. They still yeah, show these things. But not on the RNA side, yes. Not on the RNA side, yes. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks to all of you. And I hope you have enjoyed uh, today's talk as much as we did. And uh, <clears throat> next week, Thursday, same time, 3 p.m., we will come online. And uh, next week, for another four weeks, we will hear uh, the structural parts of uh, our lab journey. Uh, say so please stay tuned and uh, do take care until we are back. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>